Uh, let's, uh, let's solve some of the greatest mysteries in the world. So the first step to accomplishing anything in modern day physics is you got to get rid of the expanding universe. The Big Bang Theory is a complete disaster. Modern cosmology doesn't work. So the alternative is gravitational redshift. And what I mean by that is the, the cosmological redshift is the foundation of modern cosmology. And so the, it's what the cosmologists do is they measure this redshift and then they assume that the universe is expanding and then they, from that measurement, they can calculate the rate of expansion and they go from there. So instead of doing that, we're just going to assume that it's caused by gravitational redshift. Now, when you there's a lot of people that would argue with me and say that there's not enough mass or it's not this or that, you know, there's, there's all kinds of these silly arguments that aren't true. What I'm proposing here is not that, uh, I, it's, it's what I'm doing is, is you just work backwards from Hubble's law and then find whatever you need to create the gravitational redshift or to create the cosmological redshift from gravity, whatever mass you need, you calculate that out. Now, when you do that, you get a uniform gravitational field of 3.5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters per second squared, something like that. Um, and then an observable radius of something like 1.28 times 10 to the 26. It's like 13 billion light years. It's basically the same, same as everything. My, uh, meters per second or my gravitational acceleration is all jacked up but this is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters per second squared this is photoshop this i wanted something that i could i could move stuff around move this box around it's just not worked out that great but you know i'm, I'm still going with it so we're on this this is the Schwarzschild radius equation it's just formulated to use this uniform g the uniform g is basically just the surface gravity it's just the newtonian g um uh, the reason that I use this is because the observable limit uh, is like a cutoff. It's a natural boundary. And at that boundary, whatever the surface gravity is, we can use that as this minimum threshold. Now, it is, it, it can also be referred to as a uniform gravitational field, but it's not uniform because you, it's just a minimum. It's a, it's a, it's a, the bottom of the barrel like it's the it's the zero you 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 start off at 3.5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters per second squared because oh wow, that, that's another thing i forgot there's not a, there's no second squared here so this is just absolutely terrible but we're going to go with it um so anyways 3.5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters per second squared is the 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 minimum g throughout the cosmos and that gives us a Schwarzschild radius or slash the observable limit, an observable radius of around 13 billion light years. Um, now this right here is, uh, this is where you start to get good because now I have related this uniform G and this Schwarzschild radius to the Planck length. And by doing this, we can also relate the gravitational constant to the Planck length. Now this is, uh, this is rather great because this is allows us to um, this allows us to quantify space time and renormalize gravity on the quantum scale, which makes quantum field theory and relativity entirely compatible. Now, there's some people that might balk at this, but if you go down, of course, everybody, you know, this is an absurd claim, but this is a good way to, to do it because this is the vacuum density. If you start here, I can relate the short shield radius to the Planck length. So basically it's what we're doing here is we're, we're creating a preferred reference frame, which in quantum gravity, this is what they're actually trying to avoid. They don't want a preferred reference frame because that messes relativity up but this is a preferred reference frame for the observable radius now it would also be for whatever if you're inside if you happen to be inside of a black hole then the Planck length would be different for you also but uh, 
that's fine. You know, uh, we're not we're not measuring the Planck length inside black holes. We're talking about the Planck length. Uh, NC in relativity, if you're going to have a length, you can't have a preferred reference frame because then it wouldn't be relative anymore. In other words, a preferred reference frame is is if that link is going to be standardized and it's going to be the same in all reference frames, then you have to have one reference frame that it's preferred in. Well, the preferred reference frame for this is the observable radius, the observable universe. And so it's it acts as all one object. We're inside this singular object. And we get a very, very low vacuum density this way, which you know, it helps everything out. This is, this is the problem because there's these extreme, they call it the divergences. They're, uh, 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 high energy divergences where this gravitational constant has a negative mass, uh, dimension in it. And it really, it really jacks every, all the equations up and it gets infinite. But the observable limit puts a cutoff to that. And then, we're also able to make g dimensionless, or it's actually a, it's what uh, it's g is obtained. We or we derive it from the observable radius. Uh, so this resolves the vacuum catastrophe. Now, if we move on to the, I fixed the uh, the meters per second squared up here. By the way. So if you uh, move on, let's move on to the, uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So we have a Schwarzschild radius, and so we should also have Hawking radiation. So this equation is for the Hawking radiation. Uh, if we assume that the cosmic microwave background radiation is Hawking radiation, there will be a blue shift because it's coming from the observable limit all the way so it's the opposite because it would be it's not coming from a star it's manifesting from 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 the vacuum from virtual particles uh and so there's this extreme blue shift this would be the maximum factor of change for anything for grant well as far as relativity goes uh it's 1.9 times 10 to the 30th and so that that's a z so that's a z equals 1.9 or 1.9 times 10 to the 30th. Uh, it's extreme. That's that's huge. That would be the maximum because it's from the observable limit, from the observable universe. Um, this is, see, in quantum field theory, you can't use uh, the Schwarzschild metric or anything like that for the, the quantum scale. You have to have flat space uh and so it's like they just use minkowski space and it's what you're doing is what i would propose and I, I think this is basically what most people in the field think is that you have this lattice structure you have a grid like lattice structure and each each point in space time is one plank length apart uh and so this this is just me relating the Planck length to the Schwarzschild radius. I'm not even sure about this. It's it's really not even necessary because if we relate the Planck length to the Schwarzschild radius, we can just use the Schwarzschild metrics. Um, I like to look, view the Schwarzschild metric as uh, the exterior solution as redshift and the interior solution as blue shift. I think this is appropriate. Now, in this context, okay, we're talking about kind of like cosmology and just basic general relativity. There's all kinds of uh, things that you can do with general relativity, and but this is just at the most fundamental level. When you anytime you have spherical symmetry, and we have spherical symmetry in the universe. In fact, the universe gets more symmetrical uh, the larger it is. And so Birkhoff's theorem takes over, and we use we just use the Schwarzschild metric. Um, and here I have the Planck length inserted to show you that it's relational, and we can we can use this. Uh, we we can you can just combine general relativity and quantum field theory because of all of these fundamental constants that we have. And so the same thing is going with 
with the interior metric. Now I'll give you a, kind of a rundown as to what I think about this. See, I have two circles here and this white line, the, the radius, this would be the radial coordinate. Um, the beginning of the light wave, if it, if it is, if its origin is at the highest gravitational well, which a star, if we're talking about starlight, then the star is going to be the center of the metric and wherever you observe it is the end of the metric. Because it's really is what we're doing is we're only talking about the full length of the light wave because the light wave is the geodesic that will describe space time. And so if we can, if we can describe the light wave, then we can describe space time. And so you, wherever it's emitted is the beginning. That would be the center of the metric. And then wherever it's observed would be the center of the other metric. So you have two metrics. You have the uh, uh, the emission and the observation, and so that's that's basically what this is. So if this is just one inch apart, then you'd have two one inch metrics, and that's what you would describe. And now that would not actually work because, I mean, it would work if there's nothing else around, you know. But there's a, the, the 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 rest of the universe is there. So all of these metrics are really the the radius is the observable limit, the Schwarzschild radius. And it's what you're doing. If it was one inch, then you would just be right here. It would be right past the beginning mark. And you would, but you would have to account for everything else too to make sure that the space time is the right measurement or, or whatever adjustment to make sure everything's adjusted correctly. You would, you would use all, all of the radial coordinate, but, <coughs> but for most of this stuff, because of Birkhoff's theorem, it's just it's just whatever is in here is for the redshift man i think i just went off the rails a little bit right there this is a little it's a little tricky just to talk about like you can't just explain general relativity to people like i have i have it in my head and i know how the math works and everything but explaining it is just it just doesn't sound right but anyways this is uh we'll go through and review so if we're if we're no longer using a the big bang model uh, and the universe is static that solves inflation and dark energy and any other problems associated with the with the big bang we don't have to worry about those those are no longer problems if you have this universal g this universal gravitational acceleration or universal gravitational field or minimum gravitational field uh then this explains dark matter because this is all, this is 2x the Mond constant. And so I'm 99.9999% certain that this is how you resolve the dark matter problems is you just use this Mond constant uh, or this universal minimum gravitational field. So that's dark matter, dark energy, inflation. What else? Cosmic microwave background radiation, quantum gravity, I don't know. What other kind of stuff should we cover? <laughs> we just solved the greatest mysteries in physics in a 13-minute YouTube video. I'll let you guys uh, figure out if I'm right or wrong. Anyways, y'all have a great day. Happy Thanksgiving.